sorry. Hello and welcome to Doof Game Club, Doof Media's exploration of the joy of play. I'm Ruben Morehouse. And I'm Elliot Diebold. And we are here to talk about a three-pack, a triple kill of games. Um, <laughs> we talked about three games this month. If you want to know the backstory to that, go watch last month. I'm not going to get into it, but... Um, yeah, we talked about three different Australian indie games uh, this month. We talked about Florence by Mountains, Paperbark by Paper House, and Getting Over It with Bennett Foddy by Games by Bennett Foddy. I think it's just by Bennett Foddy. I don't think he has, like, a studio, so... Um, well, I found this logo, so... I mean, yeah, there's something. fair enough. Legit. <laughs> I think it's legit. Um, yeah, three very interesting games, all Australian, and I think... Just before we get into it, I just want to say I was so happy with these games as a representation of the Australian game development scene because it's like, yeah, I really feel like Australia has a lot of, we don't, just to, okay, we're going to get to the backstory here of, of Australia's game dev scene. We have Melbourne, which has government funding, but apart from that, no states have good government funding for interesting uh, games, which means that yeah, we don't have a Vic huge... So film Victoria basically carries the game industry in Australia. Yes. Um, they supported games like Paperbark and other games that you are probably familiar with, like uh, Untitled Goose Game as an example. Anyway, um, Australia doesn't have a huge game scene, but I think what we do have is a lot of really cool people making really interesting things. Basically, the game scene has propped itself up in Melbourne and, and around the rest of Australia with, like, uh, p communities just making cool things together. And I'm I'm proud to say that, uh, well, at least Florence on Paperbark are two good examples of some of the weird and zany shit that comes out of Australia. Getting over it with Bennett Foddy. I mean, we'll claim Bennett Foddy. He's an Australian, even though he lives in New York. I think we can still <laughs> claim him as having that Australian vibe, he, you know. He was down on Wikipedia as Australian-American, so we got first listing. <laughs> yeah, we got first dibs on that. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, so we're going to be talking about three games this month. Um, I guess we'll start with getting over it, shall we? Yes, we shall. Uh, so I guess the thing to discuss first about getting over it is just how great of a core concept <laughs> it has, I guess. Is that, is that right? Like, yeah. Wait, well, as someone who played Quop a ton in like high school and saw mm. GURP and some of the other ones, like those games to me, um, were just like, Haha, it, it's hard and, and stupid and annoying. Um, yeah. and this, this feels like the realization of that core concept where like getting over it is yeah. that, but for a reason and it te it's teaching <laughs> yes. you something as it does it. It's perfect. I, it, you can really feel that it's the natural evolution of the kinds of games that Ben Foddy has made over yes. the over the years, like, you know, Quop obviously is the big example, but a bunch of his games are kind of about exploring the relationship of frustration with the player. And this one does that, but clearly takes uh, what what Foddy has, has kind of been playing with and toyed with and learned over the, you know, 15 years or so that he's been making these kinds of games and distills it into this, like, purest reflective yeah. experience on this exact kind of vibe. It's um, almost like he was asked, why do you make these games? and decided to make a game about why he makes these games. Oh, Ruben? Me, uh, this... Sorry, I oh. lost you for a sec. Sorry, I drop out for a second. Um, yeah, no, you're right. It, it, it's it's his game as a response to what interests you about games. What is it that, that interests you the most about games? And it's, you know, the relationship that the game and the player have with each other over time and the kind of emotional connection. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 100%. Um, I mean, just, like, I guess while we're talking about the game in general, I think the the, the level design, and I use the singular for level there, um, because mm -hmm. that's, that's, like, all it is. Um, it's just it's just masterful. Like, I suppose I don't need to turn this into let's go through every obstacle and talk about why it's genius, um, although we mm. totally can if you want. Um, mm. But, like, the... I, yeah, I don't know. It's just like every time I sort of encountered a new area or a new obstacle, I was just amazed at like what he did. Like the bucket would probably be my go-to of like just when I thought I'd seen everything. 
the fucking bucket showed up and i was just like oh okay like i can see how this is going to require skills i haven't had until now yeah i i think this game obviously it's a hard game with a capital h but bennett has clearly put a lot of work into like balancing it and designing it so it's not a game that feels like he's just thrown stuff at the wall and you have to deal with it mm. you know like it's clear that a lot of thought has gone into not just the the different challenges but the progression of challenges and 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 the specific challenges and how they will make you feel at different parts of your adventure, right? Like, yeah. you know, we have, you know, obviously spoilers are going to come up. Uh, I think we shouldn't spoil the final thing no. out of respect to Bennett. But um, towards the end, there's, uh, you know, this ice mountain that you're climbing up, right? And this ice mountain is the perfect example to me of, like, it just forces you to be introspective, in a really wild yeah. way. Um, and so at the end of this, at the end of the game, he's put this obstacle that forces you to go slow and really think about what you're doing and really feel what's going on here. And I just think that's a perfect example of how well it's all put together for that kind of effect. It's a, it's a really good penultimate, uh, like challenge. Yes. Um, because of the way it forces you to slow down and be careful. And that also gives Bennett's narration the opportunity to pop in and mm. chat to you. Um, it looks like we've outrun the video. Um, Speed it up, Elliot. Pick it up. <laughs> just play it again. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, like, to, to me, some of the examples I think about, like, when I think about how well crafted the level is, is like something like the chimney. I remember the first time I got to the chimney, mm -hmm. I was like, this is bullshit. This is such a wild increase in the difficulty that what is being asked of me. Like, it felt like, where's my easier chimney? Mm. And then, but then what you sort of see is you start, you keep hitting these new challenges and you sort of went like, that is how the game works. Like, it didn't feel cheap later on when you get to things like the bucket and the bucket's just like, okay, the snake's right there. Now you've got to totally figure out how the bucket sort of works. Uh, off you go. Like, these the game actually makes a statement out of these massive difficulty spikes. Mm. Uh, and then, yeah. you, and then you feel rewarded. Like, at, you know, at the end where you get things like the wall um, right after the chimney. And then there's like walls later on. And they're so much easier because you've sort of learned that technique. So yeah. in between those difficulty spikes, you're getting the skills you've learned, like reinforced and rewarded. It's crazy to me how hard I found the wall for the first three or four hours of play. And then by the time I got to the next version of the wall, which is, you know, the, the final challenge is this kind of radio tower thing yeah. that is basically like the wall again, but harder. I was like, oh, yeah, it's just the wall. And I found the wall hard, so I'll find this hard. And I did find it hard. But then when I would fall down, I could just scale the wall in like 30 seconds tops, you know. Um, I think this game... It's it's crazy how much you grow in this game. Like I was having things where uh, once I was up to the part to the to the end, um, if I ever fell down, I would do the whole bit again, and I would do the bit that was like the stairs and the kind of carpenter's run. And I found that part so much fun to just kind of swing through. Like it was never a challenge to me after I got through it, after I you know battled my way through it a few times, and you just feel so competent afterwards <laughs> it's just so good how it does that yeah I, that's what this game is is it is this feeling of mastery that you get yeah um, for, for for getting over it <laughs> i was trying to think of another way to say that um yeah I keep losing you um oh. yeah so okay should we um move on to your next point Yes. I just, I mean, we, we kind of touched on the fact that this is an evolution of, of Bennett's, um, you know, designs and stuff. Uh, I think it's funny how this game just feels so much like, like a game developer's perfect game. Like um, some other games that have been talked about on Doof are, or, or the Beginner's Guide is a game that's been talked about on Doof, right? And that's a really a game developer's kind of game. You know, it's very much like sure. discussion about games and, and things about game development and all that stuff. And we're talking about the Stanley Parable, which I think also is very much a game developer's kind of game. 
Um, I just kind of love the vibe of it. And I think it's great how getting over it is almost striving for being pretentious. And because of that, yeah. it just is so endearing. <laughs> uh, yeah, the way, the way like Bennett's narration comes in and just sort of alternates between genuinely heartwarming and just making fun of you, sometimes both at once. Um, yes. It's, it's so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's just, I just love, I don't know. It just, like, it speaks, and maybe it is because I am a game developer, but it just, this kind of game just speaks to me, you know? Yeah. Like, the idea that he just used a bunch of sh- trashy recycled assets and and made that work for the game is very fun and genius. Right. And, and not just made that work for the game, but, like, made that into part of the message that he's trying to talk about of, like, you know, this, I mean, he, there's, there's points in here about reusing assets and asset flip games. And can you call that art and what is art and a game's art? And it's kind of tapping into that whole kind of cultural zeitgeist, which I think was especially, I mean, has always been a, a conversation, but has been, was especially prevalent in like 2017 when this game was made or when this game was released, probably a little bit before then this vibe of like games as art and what is an art game. And is this an art game? Like this feels yeah. like the, you know that painting where it's uh, the urinal and it's from like 1913 yes. or whatever, yes. yeah, and it's one. very famously a, a, an early piece of, po- I guess, postmodern art that is questioning, hey, what is art? This feels like the game equivalent <laughs> of that, right? Where it's intentionally saying to you, "What this game can't be art," and you, ha- you, it forces you to stop and think, "Well, is it? I yeah. don't even know. What is it like?" <laughs> half of it is so artistic and so clearly artistically put together. And the other half is him saying, well, this game's not art. It's trash and you're trash. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's um, just so great. Yeah. 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 Like, like, you know, the part that we've been going through for most of this clip, the, the like furniture thing, he's just grabbed a bunch of furniture pictures and like thrown them together. And there's a toilet in there for some reason. Like it's, it's like such a trash aesthetic by design, but that's kind of, the, that's the statement that he's making, I suppose, as, as you said. I got to clarify because it was bugging me. The piece of work is called Fountain by Marcel Duchamp, okay. which is just, yeah, it's just a urine. Anyway, and that's what this game feels like to me. It's the fountain of video games, which I think is so great. <laughs> I, I will say the one, the one downside that felt un, either unfair or unintended to the asset flip mm aesthetic was um the sometimes i struggled to know what was in the foreground and what was in the background um like just off the top of my head when i got past the anvil jump and there's like the telephone box i spent Mm. like you know a solid minute trying to get to the telephone box um (laughs) yes (laughs) the first time i climbed the chimney i thought i was going to land on the tree that comes out of the top of chimney there's a background mm. tree and there's like, there's no, there's no fading or anything to suggest that it's in the background, not the foreground, which was like, mm. there's like maybe the one thing I would, the one change I would suggest to this game would be to make it a little clearer. More clear I did, I, delineation. Of yeah, background. I, yeah. I didn't feel like that's what it was trying to do, but like this game never really was... tried to trick you. It was never unfair. And I think no. that's a huge part of it. Yeah. Well, it, it never was unclear what you're kind of expected to do, right? Um, I had one moment like that as well, which was uh, after Bucket, there's a bit where there's like a wooden bridge to the left. And my first instinct was to climb over and go to the left to progress, but that's just... There There are some moments that are a bit like that, but I think it worked out. Sorry, you, you cut out for a bit there. Oh, did I? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I was saying I had a moment like that at the wooden bridge above the bucket as well. But no, you're right. It's um, I, I think that is maybe the one flaw that I would find with this game. Yeah, and it's it's such a minor quibble. Um, because like yeah, like overall, like things like you know the snake. It says do not ride the snake. Like it's such a fair yes game. Like when I saw that, I was like, there was a part of me that was like. Does that mean I should ride the snake? And then I was like, I don't think this game has ever lied to me. I think I should not ride the snake. 
Uh, and as we saw from that montage earlier, uh, that was the right call. Yes, don't do that. Yeah. I, I want to say one other thing, which I think applies to all of the games that we're going to talk about here. Maybe Paperbark a little bit less so, but for all three of them, I feel like it would be fair to call these games perfect in the sense that they so clearly set out to do a thing and just exceed at the thing that they are doing. <laughs> like, yeah, I know what you mean. Like, what they're wanting yes. to do. Like, they achieve their goals very effectively. Yes, they just are so... Uh, I don't know. It just it's, it's great to me to see games that are like, here's what this game is going to be, and then just kind of knocks it out of the park. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I, um... Yeah, like I'm, I'm just trying to think of other things I would suggest to change in any of these games, and I can't come up with anything. Like they, they're mm. all, they all do what they're aiming to do. They, they didn't set the loftiest goals, maybe, but they set goals and they achieve them very strongly. Yeah, um, I want to talk a little bit about something interesting, which is that we've done a few roguelikes on the game club now, and um, I think there's a comparison to be made between getting over it and a roguelike, which is that. I think the thing that really draws me in for roguelikes and draws a lot of people in for roguelikes is this idea of it's a game that is the same ish every time you play it. And it's just you as the player that is the differentiating factor, your knowledge, your experience, blah, 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 whatever. Yeah. And I think that's why getting over it works so well. I mean, that's something that is not, not uh unique, like not unique to roguelikes or this game. It's, it's something that is, about um that is about just games in general games are about getting better as a player and feeling that mastery but i really do feel like there's an argument to be made for getting over to be a roguelike now i'm seeing a comment in (laughs) chat that i want to point out and address as well dawn has said you're missing the procedurally generated aspect though and i think the comparison to be made is that the procedurally generated aspect of roguelikes is something that you have to learn as a player to deal with and master and maximize. And honestly, when you start playing Getting Over It, the the randomness of the hammer is that is that aspect of this game. Like the fact that you kind of need to master exactly how the system of the hammer works. And if you don't learn enough about it, you just aren't, you're just going to be firing off in random directions, right? I think that's the comparison that I would make, and that's my thesis for like getting over it is a roguelike, and it's great. <laughs> uh, yeah, I definitely agree. There's that parallel of the reason FTL felt good towards the end of, of us playing it was I felt like I had gotten good. Um, mm. Getting over it is very much the same. In, in fact, I, well, I mean, I, I got it more with getting over it than any other game ever, I think. Like, it, it mm. achieved it so well. Um, but that sense of like the game didn't change, I did, and like I have gotten better. Uh, this game is just masterfully crafted to make you feel that. Mm-hmm. And part of that is yeah, like, like the controls feel broken and random and janky when you start. By the time you finish, it's like you, all, what you've realized is they're just unintuitive. But the logic is there; it just takes you a while to figure it out. Yes. Yeah, they're not broken. They make perfect sense once you've spent an hour, or an hour and a half learning them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Good times. Uh, I mean, speaking of... Sorry, just, the... just one other one other quick little thing um, on that. Like, I just want to say as well, talking about, like, the controls, something I consistently underestimated in this game was how accurate the colliders and the physics were going to be. Like, I kept assuming mm. the game was worse than it was, and it wasn't until... I really got to the ice cliffs that I appreciated how crafted like all the colliders and stuff were because the ice cliff obviously sort of hides little divots in the colliders and you got to find them. Um, yeah, like, I don't know, just such an impressive uh, situation for like mm. how, yeah, I just underestimate because it was the trash art, I guess. It was like, oh, these are just recycled things. They've probably got box colliders and shit on them. Like, <laughs> yeah but they, it's like no it's, it's all very it's all very yeah. accurate i mean even to the extent that the different kind of friction materials on the different yeah. objects are become kind of knowable based on like oh this is a metallic object it's going to collide kind of like this yeah it's going to be kind of get that sense for it. bouncier than dirt 
Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> what a great game. And uh, what a a game that is a perfect example of why the game club is awesome and so much fun to me because it's so <laughs> um like the community was able to so effectively rally around and have awesome experiences together playing this game even though it's just a weird single player game (laughs) yeah i had so much fun following other people's journeys in this as well as my own ellie did you know that you can press control r to view the map no i heard it was zoom out oh sorry zoom out Um, no it activates the jetpack (laughs) (laughs) that was my favorite one um yeah should we talk about some of the some of the I mean, that's really the vibe of this game, right? Is it's, it is, you just know it's going to feel so good when you eventually get over it. And yeah. then you do, and you've gotten <laughs> over it, and it's just great. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to talk about that in a bit as well. But well, yeah, one thing I do want to say on that. So I, I've pulled out, we had a number of patrons come back to this game or discover this game and do very well. And I wanted to hi- highlight Jonleth. Uh, in particular, who uh, was sort of sharing their journey as they went. So I've got like they just f- got their fiftieth clear. Which, yes, again. Well, well that's the thing. Congratulations. So this, this was the first clear, so that they uh, journalists kept posting them uh, in the in our channel on Discord. So the the clear time there is like five and a half hours, but journalists had actually control art a number of times, so it was actually mm-hmm. more like twenty one hours that it took to to do it the first time. Then. About a day later, we all got this thing. Uh, Joe was cleared it again in 45 minutes uh, the next day. And then I would picked this one out a couple of days ago when I made these slides. Uh, they had 14 wins and were down to doing it in eight and a half minutes. As you said, John Wolf just posted they just got the achievement for finishing at 50th for their 50th time. And they've gotten down to like seven minutes. Like it's just. Yeah. Wild. I mean, that's. That's a success story for this game, if there ever was one. And I think we had others, like uh, the Bishop 8, I also think, went from 0 to 50 this month. Mm. Um, I personally, I think my time for the first one was like 6 hours, and then my I did my second run on the same session. I was like, oh, let's start a new run, see how far I get, and I ended up finishing it in half an hour. Damn. Um, I never um, finished my second run, Elliot. I, I started a few second runs... But I just got too frustrated by the hat jump and the anvil jump. <laughs> okay, let's talk about this because I want to go through some of the things with you because I think we have completely opposite opinions on what's hard because I never found hat or anvil hard. That's crazy. <laughs> That's so crazy. They're like, clearly the hardest part of the game. They're not. It's like, what about like bucket? How much did you struggle with bucket? Bucket's so easy, Elliot. No, it's not. I never you struggled with it a single time. time. <laughs> That's so fascinating. You know what the difference is, Elliot? I think you were a good pogoer and I was a good swing and flicker, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. Because, yeah, pogoing for the hat and the anvil was how I did both of those. Yeah. I think you got very good at pogoing and I never really got good at pogoing. I got good at, like, swinging and flicking myself. If you go back to, I think it's slide. Yeah, the four. orange one where you were fucking zipping around up to the stairs yeah. and stuff. Yeah, I I will say I put in the video that I chose for slide four just because it shows me getting through the <laughs> carpet the stairs stuff really quickly, which was one of my favorite bits. <laughs> and I remember you specifically had a lot of trouble with yes, it when I was I watching. Did. Oh, I, yeah, that was that was the worst part about orange for me is, I it, it took me about four attempts to do orange but that was about three hours of gameplay because i was so shit at the part after the stairs i could get yeah. up the stairs no worries it was after that I just it's the with the it. security camera and the start of carpentry yeah. run yeah. yeah easiest part in the game as i like to call <laughs> it <laughs> um yeah. yeah but so yeah just like just as evidence for how good this game is we had a number of people go from i quit i've spent 20 hours finishing this to yeah i just got my seven minute clear yeah um cheapers like yeah in insanity and uh, yeah like even myself like just being like i'm gonna do another run see how far i get half an hour later i've done a second run like that yeah i did not Mm. expect it but it's a testament Mm. to how good the game is at teaching you how to do it i i just i felt so proud when i beat it you know i wish i had the clip of, of me finishing i had this huge grin on my face 
because um for those who didn't follow I, I did stream and i actually had a heart rate monitor on for the second half which was a lot of fun <laughs> um, uh, i got over orange with that thing on i think my heart rate went to like 130 um which is just insane what a game such a great way to play games with a heart rate monitor. <laughs> Got into more horror games with your heart rate monitor on earlier. I was playing Isola- Alien Isolation as bonus content with a heart rate monitor ages ago. That's great. Ah, um, <laughs> okay. I guess there's the, the last thing to talk about for getting over it is just the general... Like, again, I feel like we should applaud the sense of humor of this game, right? Yep. So we got up here the achievements list, which I think is just such a great way to capture it because it's such a fuck you achievement list. It's like finish the game, finish it twice, fifty, finish it fifty times. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> well, but the thing about the finish it fifty times is what well, as you finish it for the first fifty times, your cauldron gets got more and more gold. So once you finish it for the fiftieth time, you have a solid gold cauldron. <laughs> just as another that. like, hey, thumbs up to you, buddy. You did it. It feels like um, your dad, Bennett, is patting you on the head and calling you sport. <laughs> um, I didn't know it got, like, progressively more golden. I just assumed it, does. it like, flipped. Uh, oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> it's I mean, so good. Yeah, like, just the other humor in this game, like, the way Bennett is just condescending you or encouraging you or somehow both, uh, mm. when you have a big fall and he just starts playing, like, shitty free country music he must have gotten <laughs> off like freesound.org um, we call it fallout music elliot music that's reached the public domain so games can just use it <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah. um yeah like just i like I, I had a ball getting uh condescended at by bennett mm. also, yeah, wait so okay 6.2 percent of players get over at once mm. and then what, 75% of them, 4.4%, make it a second time. Mm. What's crazy, though, is then a third of those players actually make it up 50 times. Like, that's... For the well, massive difficulty spike in doing it 50 times, that's a huge percent, right? I actually think if you're going to get over it once, yeah. you're the kind of person that might just do it just for the achievement. That's, yeah, that's like, fair. A quarter of the people who finish the game are clearly dedicated enough to be like, I own this game. I'm going to make it mine, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, still, though, like, going from two to 50 times, like, I've stopped at two. I don't know that I'm going to go for the 50. Yeah. But, like, the fact that 35-ish percent of the people who get up there twice decide to do it 48 more times is actually a very high number, I think. I don't know. Maybe you will go back and do it 48 more times. <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> I did get John with those, those seven minutes. 24 hour live stream. John Wilth was doing. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess we would normally do a Q&A at the end, but since we're going to be going game by game, if people have questions. Yeah, should we just for, do a little bit getting over, over it? it? like now? yeah feel free to chuck them in now and we'll kind of maybe we'll do it we'll still do a q a at the end but we might just like pause for questions in case you, you know what i'd say i reckon if someone makes it past orange they're gonna finish the game like i'd love to see if bennett has analytics on that like, mm. i reckon i'd be willing to bet that like 70 percent of players who make it to the to the like just past the cathedral yeah finish the game hmm because it's a fairly safe slash straightforward thing to a bucket after that. And then, you know, you get yep. back to snake. And I think journalists said they fell down the snake three times before finishing, which is like how they got so good. Cause it was like such right. a monumental task to climb up the first time. But by the time they did finish the game, they'd done most of the map like eight times. <laughs> so it's like, you know, that's just how they got so good. Right. Interesting. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Snake. I still never wrote it. <laughs> I, I no, not I yet didn't either. Snake to this day. <laughs> I got very lucky. I came very close one time, but mm. I managed to not write it. And then I thought about getting up there to write it for footage, but I realized there would be YouTube clips of it, and there were. Dawn, our opinion on the hardest couple of jumps in the game. I mean, it just is Anvil to me, even though it's so low. <laughs> it's just an easy jump. Pressure. <laughs> 
<laughs> it just, I just did it. You know, it takes me 50 times to get up and then I'm like, all right, you know, whatever. And then you fall and it's fine, but it's like, I just can't, you know. I, I Having, like, where I am now, having beaten the game twice, the thing that still scares me the most and I find the trickiest is Bucket. Um, mm. I think in my second run I got it first go, which was, like, very lucky. Um mm. I don't know why you're so scared of Bucket. It's not even that hard, Elliot. I I can't I can't deal with how it moves. Um, (sighs) I'd say apart from that, the thing I probably struggle with the most would actually still be the chimney, like, hmm, just because I kind of forget how to do it by the time I end up back there. Is it? It's the only place where you're that restricted. I mean, yeah, Carpenter's Run is kind of like that, but it's not. No, it kind of encourages There's no you to difficulty. Swing, swing around yeah. like you were doing. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Well, I do not think that the chimney is very hard, but hey, whatever, man. <laughs> you be you. I just uh, it could be because it's at the start, so I don't take it seriously. But like on my second run, that was where I spent way too much time because I was just trying to like push through it. I was like, this shouldn't be the hard part. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. It, it isn't as well. It shouldn't be, and it isn't. <laughs> <sighs> um, all right. Shall we move on to our next of three? Yes. Let's jump into Paperbark. Paperbark. So, um, do you want me to play this first video? Uh, I don't remember if it was one of mine, but yeah, go for it. Oh, yeah, you're right. This is one of mine. My bad. Um, <laughs> gotcha. As summer progresses, the land bakes under the relentless sun. So what I wanted to talk about here, uh, and this sort of applies to Paperbark and Florence, mm. I've never played any game, like, you know, these sort of short interactive stories before like you know these things go for an hour or less each um and they're almost more of an interactive story than like you know something like a platform or like getting over it which is just you know more much more controls and and gameplay than story um so it's just an interesting new experience i just wanted to talk about the experience of games like this that are uh 45 minutes long and you know are interactive stories that are designed to make you feel things through the story as well as the gameplay. Now, I know you've played some Telltale games. Yep, yep. What is it that you think is different? I mean, I I kind of see why they're different to an extent, but I'm curious what you feel is different about a game like Paperbark or Florence and The Walking Dead, for example. Yeah, that would be probably the closest thing I could map to that. But the the Telltale games go for ages, like each one's six to ten hours. Um, Mm. So it's much more of a endeavor. Whereas like these these are things like Florence or something. I sat down, I played it on Thursday evening, uh, did like the hour or whatever, and then just sort of sat on it for the rest of the night. Whereas that's not like with Telltale, it was more like a TV show that I'm binging. Mm. Um, this was just and, and Telltale. It was like a. It was more like a TV show as a story. Whereas these were like, I found these much more pointed experiences that left me feeling stronger emotions that I wanted to sit with. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I do quite love. I don't know. I, I don't know if you ever go on itch.io, Elliot, and just play some weird games, but there's some really cool. Exper- like I don't know. Uh, well, okay. Here's 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 something. We were originally when we were going to do the game club. This was going to be the indie game club, and I remember mm-hmm. one of the things that I really thought we were going to do. And I, I'm not sad that we didn't end up doing this, but was like bring these smaller experiences and talk more about some of the things that mechanically or narratively these games were doing that was so different and experimental and awesome yeah has had 
more of those experiences or if Florence and Paperback are, are kind of entry points for them too. Because I do think there's a lot of the, – I guess the statement is there's a lot of art out there that you can enjoy. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, again, this was something I sort of went through with, with some of the earlier Game Club games where it was just a genre of game I'd never played before. This was the same thing. It was a these little hour-ish long experience games games were something i hadn't really done before and it was it was fun to try it out and i really enjoyed both of them more than i actually expected to if i'm honest i kind of expected to get frustrated that they weren't proper games um but luckily they were both so strong i ended up being able to enjoy them for what they were Mm. yeah i i would strongly recommend people seek out more experience experiential games like this one um there a, a number of my favorite like my favorite moments in games have been a game that is just here to give you one specific moment yeah. and it's maybe only 10 minutes long maybe it's 30 minutes long whatever but the game exists to deliver one emotional punch to you and it does it and that's it and that's what it's there for and those kinds of games are so fascinating to me and so always so creative and interesting um i'm gonna yeah. i'm gonna tell a story about one that i i really liked i can't remember what this i can never remember what these are called and the problem is you play them and then you think about them two years later and you try and find them and you just can't <laughs> um one where uh one where it's like a puzzle game right and the way it works is you've got uh, a five by five grid and you've got like four dogs or five dogs and you have to arrange the dogs so that they're not kind of touching each other or something. It's kind of like a chess puzzle in that way. Right. Okay. And the vibe of the game is you're in an, ad- you're, you're kind of managing an animal shelter and you have to put all the dogs so that they don't fight with each other. And when you beat the level, cause it's a puzzle game, what happens is at the end of the level, a little text comes up that says none of the dogs were adopted, clean out the shelter. And the music changes and you just have to click on the dogs and you just see them disappear oh and you know god. what you're doing. Oh my god. And it's I know. And it's just <laughs> like I played this game, it's like five minutes long, and it's you it, you just it's been in my head for like ten years, this fucking <laughs> weird little flash game. Because it's so effectively had this twist on, well, this is a mechanic where you're playing a puzzle level and then you just quickly kind of wipe the board clean and go again. But it's not just gems, it's dogs, and you've got <laughs> enough theming that you know what's going on and it just sits with you for 10 years. And I'm like, the fact that five-minute-long games can do this and make you have this reaction yeah. is so magical to me. Um, yeah, just, I don't know. I'm I'm glad that we're going to have the opportunity to put... Now that we're doing some longer games, and we'll talk about this at the end, mm. I'm glad that we're going to have the opportunity to put more things like this to 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 just give these experiences to people because I think they're so special. Yeah, yeah I'm really glad you pushed for this uh, this month because these are the sorts of games I wouldn't have wanted to play. And again, mm. I'm glad, glad you changed my mind on that. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. So to, just to... Just to Sort of before we get into paperback proper, let's just talk about wombats. Talk yeah, about let's wombats. just talk about wombats. We had a wombat that used to live right outside our house when I was growing up. It had its little burrow just not far from the house. Fucking love wombats. They're the most stubborn mm. little things. It's so cool. They just don't. I, I don't think their brains are big enough to change their mind. So they don't. Like they will just walk <laughs> through things to get where they want to go. They don't. They don't route. They just. You know. It's like. It's like people when they play Skyrim, how they just go over yeah, the yeah. mountain. That's that's how they have bad is. pathfinding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they are fucking adorable, aren't they? Because <laughs> <sighs> um, I, I talked about this. I, I don't think many people know this, especially non-Australians. Um, their defense mechanism is they leave little burrows around that they can jump into head first because their ass is so hard that nothing can get mm. through it so their strategy for avo- avoiding predators is they just shove their head in the sand and like moon people and their ass is so hard that nothing can actually get them yes they've been known to crush predators with their ass in their, <laughs> their warrants <laughs> they're just i mean they're just brilliant aren't they god 
Makes me miss. Uh, you you would have met my my old dog Coco. She was. We used to call her the wombat because she, she a had, real dweeb of a dog. Yeah, but she had the she had the body type and the mentality of a wombat. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. I love wombat. <sighs> yes, they do also poop cubes. That's that's a. That they do. A they're the only animal that has cube shaped poop, <laughs> which is great. Um, Australian, evolution. About... Australian evolution really went fucking sideways, didn't it? I know. I just, I mean, this is the thing, right, about paperback. Like, this is the joy of it to me, is it's a game that just is like, shit, man, we got some cool shit, you know? <laughs> yeah, wait, that's honestly, because I, I, I feel like you, when I go overseas and you, and you talk to people who are the, like from the country and it's like, oh, what should I go and see? Yeah, it, it's it's never like oh go to a local, a local zoo or something, or, or like you know don't go to super touristy places. One of the first things I recommend to international people coming to visit Sydney is go to the Australian Wildlife Park because mm. it, it's just got all the Australian animals. It teaches you about all just the weird shit we have. Like it's very touristy, but it's still worth it just because it's so. There's so much bizarre shit in this country, and it's just worth <laughs> seeing. This is making me realize something about myself, Elliot, which is that when I travel to a new place, one of the things that I always try and do is go to a local zoo or something like that. Or, yeah. I mean, depending on where you are, zoos are not necessarily the most ethical thing, which is, again, something that I'm not used to as an Australian because we have zoos that are, like, clearly conservationist. Um, and I, it's never quite clicked for me that I, I just... I guess other places don't have that kind of thing as much of a vibe of like, just Australia has so many cool plants and animals, man. <laughs> it's just <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, definitely. Like if, if you do come to Australia, check out one of the wildlife parks. They're absolutely worth it. You'll find, you'll learn just a bunch of great, as well as seeing koalas and kangaroos and all the typical shit. You're going to find the weirdest fucking animals. Mm-hmm. I do think Taronga Zoo is a place worth visiting if you go to Sydney. And the aquariums and... Anyway. Anyway, um, should we talk about this game? I mean, the, but this is the thing about Paperbark to me, is it's like, this is why I loved it. Because it is just... Yeah. It's Eventually, it's a, a way to more deeply feel like you're connecting with Australian flora and fauna. And that's the experience that they tried to achieve. And that's the experience that I felt. And I really... I really felt it. Yeah, like there's there's definitely an educational angle to the game, um, mm. that was unfortunately maybe a bit wasted on me as like someone who grew up here and, and knows all this stuff. But like it taught it teaches you a lot about um, just like the Australian bushfire cycle and some of the the you know the animals and plants here, uh, in a really cool way. Um, mm. like the clip we we just sort of had running. If I can just replay just that clip. Um, yeah, is is sort of this is where it's talking about like the bushfire cycle here. Um Yeah. I it, like I don't know. I just thought that was really neat and it, it's cool. Like I I was flabbergasted the first time I booted it up with how it just looked like Australian bush. I, yeah. I, as an Australian, because you almost always see like you know, mostly American like flora on the TV. It, it suddenly mm -hmm. seeing on a screen like digital Australian bush, I was like, wait, what? It was almost mm. like, upsetting to see it. So beautifully made. I, yeah. I. It's weird to me. I feel like, again, we're getting really into the weeds on some of these topics here, but I, I'm, you know, 20... Shit, how old am I? 26 now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, like, I've never really, I feel like, had a lot of pride in Australian culture. And we're not going to get too political, but Australia is a place that has a lot of problems, Culture. right? Um, but this game really made me feel like, man, I'm so... There are so many things that I'm really proud that we as Australians have access to. And this is a perfect distillation of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd completely agree. Like, I, I just had a big grin on my face playing this game and sort of celebrating the Australian bush a bit because it's not something you do very often as an Australian, I don't think. 
Yeah. Um, I, I think the thing that really makes it succeed beyond the, the art, how beautiful the game is, is the soundscape to this game. Immediately, I was put back in the mind of the hikes that I've done with my parents growing up. Yeah. Oh, it, the the sounds in this game are spot on. Like, it sounds exactly like going out for a bushwalk here. Yeah. Like, to, to Actually, a, I've got, I think I have a extent. clip with the thing. Yes. Uh, yeah. Give me a second. Let me turn the sound on for it. From deep I think in the, the sound's coming to through the too loudly. The, trees, the Australian bush teems with plant and animal life. I guess it is just kind of a soundscape, so... Um, I mean, if you've played it, uh, you, you probably noticed, like, I, I definitely yes. had a moment where I sat there doing nothing and I could have just been like five Ks from my house in the bush. And I, yeah. I don't know if I would have known, like, a, I, I have to believe I just went out there and captured audio. Um, yeah. I, as soon as I turned the game on I, immediately, it just hit me with this vibe of, well, this is just, I'm just there. I'm just on a bushwalk right now. And it, if it's just so well put together in that way. I also, I, I, I want to give some extra credit to the art style for this game because it's actually incredibly low poly, but mm. the texturing in this game is so good that it's, it's barely noticeable most of the time. Mm. If you look mm. really closely at the Wombat, the Wombat's got about 20 polys. It's, <laughs> it's nothing, uh, but it's textured very well to sort of hide that fact, and it's the same with just about everything else. Um, so just a little side note, because I realized we didn't have a slide for that, like the art direction and this deserves some credit for being mm -hmm. remarkably photorealistic despite low poly yeah yeah 100 percent. you can see the polygon sometimes but it is just at the same time you can look at it and think shit this is very realistic looking <laughs> yeah. and that's a weird thought to reconcile <laughs> yeah yeah uh um, so now we have this other slide i i do think it's worth pointing out we're we're talking on these experiential games, and I think there is a a downside to this to these games. Where I think Paperbark is a, is a good example of where that can be. Paperbark is a game that I think is so so well made, but even so, has moments where it does feel a little bit uh, sparse. I guess is the word. Um, like they have these collectibles in there where you're getting I think cicadas and uh, flowers and and whatever um butterflies moths uh, presumably eating them as well which i don't think do wombats do that wombats don't eat cicadas do they i don't know if they were eating i don't know if it was eating it as much as just gathering it i think they yeah. are omnivores though god wild um <laughs> but yeah it's just like no they are I, I sorry know. they are just herbivores okay more sense. good so they don't eat cicadas. That's right. Okay, this game is no longer accurate. Bad. <laughs> I don't think you were eating the cicadas because you could click on them uh, from across the screen. Uh, it was only the whatever. bushes you went up and ate. You do eat the purple bushes. Um. So yeah, I think like that as a mechanic felt like a bit of, I don't know, maybe I would even call it like not having confidence in the core thing of what this game is trying to do and feeling like it needs to be well, we need to put some kind of gamey stuff in there, so let's have some collectibles that you can collect as you go through. I don't know if that's... I'm maybe just projecting a bit there, but it that's kind of the vibe it gave to me of, like, I actually think this game would have worked better if it was about 10% shorter and t took out the collectibles, you know? I maybe if the collectibles, more... the collectibles part. I don't know if it needed to be shorter. I did... I did get the vibe that sometimes the collectibles just like, I just kind of decided as I started playing, I'm not going to try and collect everything and explore every nook and cranny. Cause that's just going to mm. detract from my experience of the game. Yes. Um, yes. Like this is not, this is not super Mario 64. We're running around and finding every nook and cranny is the point. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I kind of agree. Like I, I felt like the collectibles felt like something just that was just there to incentivize me to replay it and and i haven't gone and done that and i feel better for it like i don't know yeah uh, maybe if instead of i mean you know let's not get too backseat uh game 
designer here, I yeah. guess. But instead of like having collectibles, you know, moments of the moments that I found myself really enjoying. And there's one specifically where it's in the, I think the fourth chapter, which is called like river birds or something. And you're walking along and there's a big black, I don't know, a cormorant or something or a raven or something. Yeah. And you just kind of walk past it and it flies away. And yeah. just like those kind of bits are the parts where I really found myself enjoying like, oh shit, there's a kookaburra or there's. Yes. Oh boy. Just gonna order more of that stuff, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Like maybe instead of the the fifty cicadas or whatever, it could have just been like five hidden interactions with other animals. Yeah, that they had the stickers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of yeah. similar to the sticker things, but maybe some of yeah. you know, some of those bits where it's like the wombat interacting with another thing that wasn't necessary. Mm. But yeah. Mm. Well, yeah. should we move on to our final game of the evening? Yeah, I guess before we do, just if anyone does come visit Australia and wants to go on a bushwalk, hit us up. We'll yep. point you to some good bushwalks in the Blue Mountains or whatever. Mm-hmm. Or if you, if you want to come to the middle of nowhere, there's plenty of bushwalks yeah, around. Yeah, if you me. want to go to Nowheresville where Elliot lives. <laughs> <laughs> Not much but bushwalks to do here, so uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I know where to go. <laughs> All right, should we talk about Florence? If anyone has any paperback questions, I guess, put them in uh, put I'll them in chat. I'll just do them at the end. Let's just do both these games together. Okay, cool. Uh, but yeah, um, but you probably can't really hear me right now very well because we're playing just the Florence soundtrack. <laughs> That's what this slide is. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll stop that there because I could just listen to this for the whole 40 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I know, this. right? The, the music oh. in this game is one of the standouts. This, this game has absolutely phenomenal uh, scoring. Did this game give you the vibe of, you know how people have done like, I don't know what the word for it, like a kind of digital album experience kind of vibe where it's it's not it's an album but it's also expressly meant to have a little bit more to it like it's meant to be a kind of film plus album you know or whatever um that's th- this game gave me those vibes i i get that like I, I i think i sort of can understand what you're talking about and i do agree that there's like this game puts its music in the foreground and wants you to experience a lot of the emotions through through the audio. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Very well. I guess the thing I want to talk about for this game, I mean, it's a be- it's I guess we can just start by saying this is a fucking beautiful game, right? Yeah. Like you just it just is there's no other word to describe it other than beautiful. But the thing I want to talk about for most of this segment of the game club is how well designed it is. Yes. Yeah, I Florence is definitely one of these ones, like, if we are talking about this earlier, like, I think it, it achieves everything it's trying to do very, very strongly. I, I actually cannot think of a single thing I would change about this game to make it better at doing it, what it is trying to do. Let me stack the Marmite jars on top of each other. <laughs> oh, yeah, true, yeah. Let us have more Marmite jars. I mean, ma- fucking Marmite, are you kidding me? It's an Australian <laughs> game. We can call it Vegemite. You no, know, the achievement I got <laughs> Says it's Marmite slash Vegemite. Marmite slash Vegemite. I don't know. What is that? Come on. <laughs> Come on, game dev. Stop pandering to these like, crowds. You're right. L- yeah. That's this the thing I This is PC culture Ball- gone mad. It's <laughs> called Vegemite. <laughs> yeah, this is the thing I change, actually. I don't need to stack them. I just need it to be called Vegemite. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we talk about this? Yeah, game. <laughs> I'll play this next clip, uh, uh, which is of the puzzle mechanics. Oh, I remember this one. This was like the one puzzle I, that actually stumped me for a sec. Looks like it did you too. I just... 
the way that this game <sighs> okay i guess the puzzle mechanic is kind of the main mechanic of this game yep. right I, I don't um know. but it's not i mean here's the thing about this game if it didn't have all the story stuff, it would basically be WarioWare, <laughs> right? <laughs> and I sure. want us to counter, like, picture this game and WarioWare in our heads and just think how different presentation can turn a game. Um, because this game is, you're kind of doing little mini games, but there's all... of what is happening in Florence's life. Sorry, you cut out for, for most of oh, that. <laughs> sorry, just as I was delivering my, my best point. These these mini games are perfectly the real goal of these mini games is they're designed to have you feel what Florence is feeling yep. in the story. Right. Like the, the mechanics of this game are there to replicate the experience that Florence is having. And they knock it out of the park so exceptionally uh yeah i agree like the the way all of the mini games serve as as a sort of metaphor for what florence is doing or going through is so good i mean the obvious and standout one is the fact that like as you spend more time with krish the puzzle there's less puzzle well, pieces in the puzzle just before you say that go to the next slide because oh, that's sorry. also what i pulled out as the okay. next video clip all right let me play this one um yeah i i saw this as well as over the course of your first date it becomes easier and easier to have that conversation and that's like amazing it's genius <laughs> it's, it's so genius <laughs> the fact that the the one i did before the bed puzzle like the pieces just don't fit together and when you realize that you're like oh what the fuck these pieces just don't fit together and then yeah. you're like oh oh shit oh yeah oh, that's the point that's the point exactly <laughs> and it's so good mm. at doing that it's I'm amazed by how, how well, like how well these mechanical interactions, very simple mechanical interactions, just get you inside the headspace of this character, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, like even the little, like like having to push the alarm and it getting really annoying that you have to keep doing that. Very or the realistic. ones where you have to push like or retweet and you just can't even see the picture. Yeah, and it's just you It's just like. You're not paying attention. Just click some buttons. And how much and that's is that it. what it's like? Like that's Exa that's exactly <laughs> it, Ellie. It's so perfect. I can't believe how perfectly designed this game is. Yeah, it's it's a it's it's a it's a masterpiece. Absolutely. Um, it. Yeah, it's, you know, it's not the largest game, but like, it's just so good at what it does. Yeah, it set, I, I, it set yeah. achievable goals and achieved the hell out of them. I think there's one other thing I want to call out, which is this game so is so good a few times has this thing of like you do a puzzle and then it reincorporates it in ways that you didn't expect. Yeah. So I think the yeah. prime example of that to me is the unpacking versus packing up where mm -hmm. you unpack and then you have to pack up and it doesn't even really matter what you do at either point, but you just, you feel like, or I had this experience at least of, okay, well, we've got two toasters. How can I arrange that? I'm kind of building out my space. I'll build it. And I yeah. put it into an arrangement that you I was happy with. You invest yourself itself. into the space. Exactly. Yeah. And then you pack it away. And you're just like, you d you designed that space. Yeah. It's changed slightly or it had changed slightly for me mm. over time. But I made that space and now I'm the one that has to put it in the box. Mm -hmm. And it's just, uh, okay, so I want to, I want to call back to a question that somebody posted in chat when we were talking about, or when we just started talking about Paperbark. And the question was, if a game doesn't have interaction, can you call it a game? E.g. is a pop-up book a game? And I think that is missing what the point of what it is about games. It's the goal of a game isn't for you to be able to change the ending. Mm. The goal of a game, in my opinion, is for you to be able to get more immersed in what is happening than if it was a movie or a TV or TV show or whatever, right? Games, even if you have no agency over the ending of the story, the ability to interact puts you in the 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 you know the the mindset of the characters, and that's what it is, right? That's the that's the thing that I think makes games such a unique and interesting art form, and that's what Florence. 
absolutely perfects. Yeah, I, I almost just like the the thing with this for me is, like, if you compare Florence to Breath of the Wild, like Zelda, like it's mm. just the the concept of Basically. game has lost all meaning to me at that point because mm. it's just like like you know it's it's kind of like taking a reddit post and comparing it to like you know an agatha christie novel like it's just they're they're in they're, they're such different things but the thing is the thing that makes florence an, a, a masterpiece of a game is the same thing that in my mind makes breath of the wild a masterpiece of a game and it's that in florence you play this game and oh. sorry play this game and God damn it. The, you play this game and through the mechanics of playing the game you feel florence's story right yeah, you feel yeah, it yeah and for florence it's you're you're experiencing a story of a relationship for breath of the wild you're not feeling a story of a relationship obviously you're feeling what does it feel like to wake up and become a hero and explore an a, a, a amazing world sure. the thing that makes breath of the wild and florence excellent games is the same which is that the way that they are designed make you feel the feelings that this character feels and you feel the excitement and you feel the joy and you feel the the drama or whatever. I think that's what makes excellent games is you feeling the emotions that they want you to feel, you know? I, I definitely agree that, like, I, I would sort of capture this core concept of what game is, is interactive media that's designed to make you feel something. But there's such a broad mm. range in how you interact with that. Like, I, I feel like, you know, something like Florence, it's it's sort of point and click. As you said, it's like little mini games. You don't change the outcome was the example. Whereas, you know, like in, mm. in, in so many other games, it's it's your story more than, say, Florence's. And there's a lot, like, much more complex interaction to the point where mm. the two become not even really comparable to my mind. Like, it... But it, mm. it's more a matter of like talking to someone and figuring out, okay, this may not be the sort of experience you're looking for. Sure. Um, yeah. Like, fair like, like they're just so they're so different in their methods of achieving that goal of, of giving you emotion that I could be like, you know, in much the same way, someone I might say to someone, oh, you shouldn't watch this. It's a horror show, and you don't like horror. Like it's, mm. it's the same sort of thing. Mm. Yeah, I guess my criteria for a game that I'll enjoy is, does it deliver the emotional? impact to me that it is intending to mm. and i love breath of the world and i love florence because they both check that box <laughs> yeah that's fair that's fair whereas like yeah i could just i but i would never put them in the same box myself without you sure. making a comment like without that. a lot of asterisks <laughs> yeah <sighs> man what a beautiful game god um some people talk about the story in the chat which i do want to bring up because i love i think they're right like the the way it just sort of ends without them needing to get back together or Florence needing to find someone like that's just, that's been my thing for the last five years is I always like stories, particularly about relationships that end with people realizing they don't need to be in one. Mm. Um, Cause I just feel like that's sort of going against the grain of what most media has been telling us since I have been mm. alive. Mm. Um, and that's, I, I think I liked how Florence did that. It's sort of, you know, she finds herself and that's really what the game was about. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it is. It's great. <laughs> I I feel like I don't have anything more profound to say on it than that. It just that's what it's about, and it's awesome. Yeah. Oh, I forgot you flipped people over. Oh, I know. Sorry. So many little interactions. I think one other thing that I really liked in this was um, an experience I also had with this game that I saw someone else mention in chat, which was expecting the mother to be a villain to an extent. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a, I mean, I'm not an Asian Australian, but I have friends and who, who are Asian and based on my ob observation of the interactions with their mother, this is a very authentic experience. Yeah. Um, I, I have the same impression. And I just think that the vibe of having a kind of overbearing mother who is, you know, basically behaving the exact way that Florence's mother does. And then th having Florence have this real emotional moment where she just kind of needs human support. And that also comes from her mother because of course it does. It's her mother, right? Like, God, it just is so beautiful in so many ways, this game. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just finding myself captured just watching 
the footage of the in the background going on in between in between you talking like it's just i'd love to play more i know i get i can't help but um but get caught up in it can't help but get caught up in it sorry i i didn't catch who i see i feel bad because i'm calling out some great things that people in chat have said but because we're following a script, I look at it and I think, oh, that's a great point. I'll bring it up later. Yeah. But then I haven't got it in front of me to look at the person's name. So I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just pulling out quotes that have sparked thoughts in me, but I don't have the names attached to the thoughts. <laughs> uh, yeah. So with that, why don't, we, why don't we have a bit of a Q&A on just any of the games, really? Mm. Anybody have anything they want to say or questions they want to ask the hive mind? Hmm. Yeah, any other thoughts? Any other questions? I definitely, when I was packing up, had that thing. I I put, like, all of Chris's stuff the hell away. I was like, no, fuck you, you're dead to me. <laughs> I was angry at, at how it had gone. Oh, really? I put all of his stuff away, too. I think there was one or two things where I genuinely couldn't remember. It was in the pantry. I genuinely couldn't remember. Is this... Yes. I, I was going to say mine, and that's a testament to this <laughs> yeah. game, right? Is this mine, or is this uh, Christian's? Yeah, exactly. um, you are Florence. Yeah, fuck. Such a, so well made. Goddamn. Yeah, people are congratulating you on your picks for the three-pack. I, I would... Yeah, hey, you're welcome, folks. Pack that up. These were these are all great. And, and such a variety, too. Like, I think there, there was maybe some overlap with Paper Park and Florence in the, just, like, the length and the interactions, but, like... The, the combination of the trilogy uh, with, with getting over it on the side of just like, <laughs> here, have these nice little beautiful experiences and also go to hell for six hours. Getting over it is the exact opposite of Florence, <laughs> I think. Like, if you put every, all games on a map, literally getting over it and Florence at exact opposite ends, but I think that's why they work so well together. Um, a question Cyber Homes was, has Ruben played any of these before? I've played getting over it for about an hour but i haven't played any of the others the reason i picked these was these are the games that when you go to the pax australia show floor um these are the games that everyone talks about <laughs> and so to me it was like i these are just the games that i know will be great oh we've got an interesting one from uh wabo who is asking uh, do you think something like Florence would be better if it was a longer and deeper experience? So maybe going back a bit to that Telltale-ish or even longer comparison we made before. Mm, it's interesting. I I think I think it's a it's a weird question because if I think. What if Florence, this game Florence, was two hours long instead? It just would be a worse game. Like, I think that's the fact. But I can also look at games that are, or look at, you know, I remember we talked about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Hmm. on on the Doofcast a while back. And if someone said to me, would you want Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. but it's only one season instead of seven? The answer is no, because right. you have time to get invested in the characters. I think the question is, it, that it has to be a different story if you're going for a different length. Like, you can't just say, I want this, but I want it to be twice as long, or I want that, but I want it to be half as short, because the two are too linked to, to yeah. for you to do that and have it be a successful operation. And with games, I think it goes another step as well, where there needs to be more variety in the interactions. Like, like for a, for a story, you need to change the story to make it five times as long. I also think if I was playing five hours of those moving puzzle pieces, by the end of it, I'd be pretty damn sick of moving puzzle pieces around. Like, you'd also need to add more gameplay. So that there's, you know, with, with games, there's another aspect to the medium, and that means you also need to change that if you're changing the the experience substantially. Mm. Yeah, I, I think I'm, ha I'm very comfortable calling Florence a... Uh, uh, perfect or almost perfect game I'm putting an asterisk on it, even though i can't think of what i would change about it but um that's not to say a game has to be 10 minutes long to be perfect you know <laughs> like yeah. what my favorite game of all time is fucking crypto the necrodancer and that's a game that i literally play forever and it has i mean it has a plot but it's one that i don't really invest in at all yeah uh, i think 
yeah, I, I, I think it's this game absolutely nailed what it was trying to do. And that's and that's because at, in part because it was an experience that was X long, you know? Yeah, I, I, I do think because because part of the reason this is being brought up is we were talking earlier in the Discord about something else, and I was saying how much I prefer long form things like TV shows and like longer web serials mm-hmm. uh, normally. Um, yeah. So you know, but that's that's not all the time. So like something like Florence stood out to me. That that said, you know, something like Florence is not going to cause me to obsess for years or months in the same way. Mm-hmm. Maybe something like. Uh, you know like worm will right like you know uh, i will obsess over a tv show like agents of shield for years florence is going to leave an impact on me but uh unless i come back to it like you know it will sort mm-hmm. of fade a bit it's just a different mm-hmm. different experience but like in saying that like i probably get almost as much out of that time with florence just in a denser packed time amount of time is i think florence is something that i could very comfortably you know hand my phone to my mum and say here spend 15 20 minutes doing this and you'll get a lot out of it and i can't yeah. give worm to my mum. <laughs> that just won't work <laughs> i wish i could yeah yeah that makes sense mm. <sighs> great month great month of games yeah this variety was fun um, i'm gonna be interested to see if how we feel about that because i think i think next month we'll talk a bit about both games and it'll be interesting to see yes. how we feel about the variety there as well <laughs> will they also work well together <laughs> is the question <laughs> Does he, do we have any other questions before we um no it doesn't, it doesn't look like it no. i do agree that people just mostly commenting on how right you are that florence is something you could just hand it hand to almost anyone and mm. like, go play this it's such a perfect uh, advocate for the beauty and artistry of video games. <laughs> so uh, good work to uh, to Mountains for that. Okay, so should we talk about what's happening next month? Because oh, yeah. we're trying another kind of experimental thing, although this one's Heck. going to be a bit more experimental. Heck yeah. Um, because uh, at the request of our patrons, we're going to try some longer games. And what that means is we're splitting them up over two months. Uh, and so what that also means is that uh, we're going to chuck a small game, uh, kind of like Paper Bark and Florence, in the middle. A little entree. Yeah, yeah. So like, like I think next month will probably be like mostly the Stanley Parable, uh, which is the short game that we'll be talking about mm-hmm. for October. But then we'll probably also talk about how Dark Souls is going for a part. Yes. Uh, and then November will be you know after two months we'll actually be ready to talk about dark souls proper hopefully yes yes i saw that we had a question that i actually do want to talk about here so i'm going to pull us back into q a for a moment which is from john uh who asked was bennett being sarcastic and i'm interested to hear your answer to this earlier the i mean the full question was was bennett being sarcastic or uh sincere yes well, yeah, I mean that's my answer too, right? <laughs> like unironically, yes, in that it's it's very Australian. Yeah, but I was, it is I was just gonna, both. <laughs> I was gonna say the same thing. It's a very Australian thing to be like, come on, you piece of it's shit. It's just both this. at the same time, and that's wonderful, <laughs> you know? Uh yeah. Yeah, I I absolutely agree. I, I thought the fact that he was talking down to me was actually endearing and made me feel encouraged not from a fuck you standpoint but from a oh like he's just he's just saying this to irritate me to help yeah exactly you know yeah it's i mean, that's the thing that i really liked about it is it so perfectly was it is at the same time being 100 percent sincere in that i do think bennett is proud of people who make it to the top of that game yep. but also he's kind of making fun of you for being a person <laughs> who makes it to the top of the game and it can just be both <laughs> especially when you have a big fall that's almost that that's the best or the most likely time that you're going to get a bunch of text uh, <laughs> from him and that's where he will often rub it you like oh you just lost a lot of progress. Pick yourself back up and keep on going. <laughs> Come on, champ. Um, um, and I, like, yeah, I thought that was, I, I thought that was great because that's the time when you're frustrated and that's when you need someone sort of like 
<laughs> making sure you're not taking yourself too seriously. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, we'll jump. We can jump back to talking about Dark Souls. <laughs> um, <sighs> um, yeah. So, Ruben, yeah. you'll you'll probably be streaming Dark Souls, right? I will. I will be doing some Dark Souls streaming. I'll probably do my first one tomorrow. It's a public. I've got. It's a public holiday tomorrow, so my schedule's a little bit funky. But I'll probably do a stream tomorrow at the normal streaming time that I do. So first experiences of Dark Souls. I have actually played, I think, some Dark Souls before, but I don't really remember. So okay. we'll see how we go. Uh, yeah, and then we'll probably both save the Stanley Parable for the, the week before the club. Yes, um, it is a shorter one, so yeah. we can give it a, give it a shot. I, I... Um, have you played stanley parable before elliot no the only the only reason i even know about it is uh when we were at uh gcap together last year uh william Pugh was the keynote speaker the guy who made it oh right yes he was yeah yes he was so that, that was where i heard about it for the first time and that's the only reason i know just about anything um we, we've got some questions of how far do we get through games so you didn't play stanley parable i have played it i've i've completed it before i kind of know what it How far did I get in Dork Souls? <laughs> in Dork hey, Souls. Um, Dawn asked me the question, how many bells did you ring? And I don't know what that means. So I'm assuming zero. <laughs> <laughs> Which probably means not very far. Yeah. Um, I think I rode on an eagle and that's it. Okay. Yeah. I have... Uh, if that's something that happens, I don't know. <laughs> maybe that's something else. I, yeah, I, I mean, from my end, I have seen the McElroy brothers play the, the pizza Dark Souls in Monster Factory. So you've already basically Yeah, so I kind of know what's up. Um, it should yeah. be easy. Uh, I, I have booted Bloodborne when I got it on PS Plus and then not started it. Good on you. Counts. So that, that's where I'm at. And yeah, Stanley Parable, I actually think William's uh, keynote thing at gcap was full spoilers for stanley parable but luckily that was a year ago and my memory's horse shit so i don't remember anything that he said about the game did you play um a while back for the doof cast they got a patreon episode where they did the beginner's guide did you end up playing that no but i've just seen matt freeman talking about it in our comments you should i think you will get i i suspect i will want to make comparisons to it next month as well so you should probably play again a short game um yeah maybe i'll try and fit that into the the week where i'm doing the stanley parable as well mm. and yeah. listen to the doof cast about that i guess as well yeah cool um yeah so go check out the the doof cast on the beginner's guide because i think that's definitely worth doing um if you want a little teaser for what we'll probably, the kind of things we'll probably be talking about when we talk about <laughs> the Stanley Parable. Um, yeah. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Yeah, this was, and yeah, thanks again, Ruben, for bringing this three pack. This was, Hey, you're welcome. This is a fun change of pace to me. These are absolutely three games I never would have played for very different reasons. Yeah. Um, yeah. Getting over it was yeah. not something I had an interest in, but I feel so much better for finishing it. Elliot, I remember so many times during the month you were saying, I'm like, you're going to get footage of the end, right? Because I'm not going to yeah. finish it. I, I was and pretty I'm convinced. Proud of you, Elliot. I was pretty we're convinced I wasn't going to finish it. I think, like, the first time I had hope was when I got past Orange and I was like, oh, okay, maybe I've been with this shot. And then I got to the bucket and I start. That was when I, the second time where I was like, I don't know if I'm going to finish this. Yeah. Um, and there, there is the stream footage of me finishing and I have the hugest grin on my face. Yeah. Good on you. Um, <sighs> absolutely a journey worth taking if you can stomach it i'm yeah. glad i was forced to um but yeah okay cool all right well we'll see everyone uh in a month uh yep. for dork souls. for dork souls and uh the Stoinly parable <laughs> mm. yeah okay. see you everybody bye